Great. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our International Grand Round. Very pleased to have once again our friend Osvaldo Henriquez from Emory University. Good morning, Osvaldo. Hey, hey, good day, everyone. I know we're coming from different parts of the world, so good, yeah. I'll say good day. Good morning for me, yes. <laughs> so, Osvaldo today is talking about a very interesting topic, which is in regards to teaching. And his uh, he's, um, topic will be focused on teaching surgical residents in the 21st century beyond see one, do one, teach one. Osvaldo, anytime you're ready, please share your presentation. All right. Uh, can you guys see it now? Uh, reshare it. Let me reshare it. Let me see. All right. Okay. How about now? You perfect. Can see it. Thank you. All right. Perfect. All right. Well, um, well, first of all, I want to, you know, thank Puya and the Necessary Society to for the opportunity to come back and talk to you all. Um, I'm coming to you from uh, Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States, uh, where I practice as an associate professor for the Department of Otolaryngology and Surgery at Grady. Uh, I'm also a rhinology endoscopic scope surgeon. Uh, but today, I'm going to talk to you as uh, Dr. Johnny said, a, a topic that's dear to my heart, and it's not necessarily clinical, <clears throat> but I think hopefully applies to all of you that are either teachers or learners. You know, um, I got no disclosures financially. Uh, again, thank you so much. I think this is a great, you know, this I think is my second or third time taking part in this uh, within with the past few years, and I consider I consider Dr. Ningani. My dearest online friend, even though we haven't ever met in person, I feel like I know him pretty and, and, and I, I look forward for the day that we meet in person, Puya. But uh, thank you again for, for having me here. I will disclose that a lot of what I'm seeing, what I'm talking about you here, are things that I learned from uh, part of my, my experience. Uh, I, I have spent the past decade here at Emory, and, uh, and I'm, I'm privileged to actually uh, have the opportunity to teach um, uh, learners at different levels. So we have our residency here at Emory. We have our rhinology fellowships, which I also take part of that in the teaching. And of course, we have our medical students. So uh, a lot of that comes from, 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 from that experience, but also for uh, my participation in, in courses, both at my home institution, Emory. I am faculty of AOM North America, which is, as you all know, a surgical society. That's the, the, its main focus is educational surgical teaching, especially in the realm of uh, facial trauma. Um, I was looking enough to take a part in a course uh, here at Emory sponsored by Stanford uh, that was uh, as far as development of medical, medical teachers. Uh, this is kind of what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, you know, kind of looking at what are the difficulties of teaching, how, you know, a little bit about the science uh, or what's known about how, how we learn, especially adult learners. Uh, how we assess learning, which is what we do usually in our trainees at every level, maybe give you some tips and some models on how can you be more in your teaching, um, and a little bit about surgical and uh, you know, how to give feedback, which is a big thing I think nowadays. Um, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to uh, I put this talk together a few years ago was because when I first became an attending here at Emory. Um, you know, uh, I, I, uh, I was coming back to my home institution. Uh, I kind of knew the system, they knew me, uh, but I always found it interesting that, you know, they were looking at my clinical abilities, were looking at maybe my research abilities, uh, but nobody really asked me about my teaching abilities. They sort of assumed the fact that because we we choose a life in, in academic medicine that you're going to be a good teacher. But, you know, sadly, we all know that we have all, we all hopefully have experience uh, being taught by Folks that are probably amazing surgeons, but not very, but not necessarily the best teachers, right? Uh, and I think you know, and when I was looking for uh, resources to get better at teaching, especially through my institution, a lot of it was really in the realm of what folks, for example, in internal medicine do, like teaching during rounds and things like that. And not much really applied to what is a unique teaching environment, which is the OR, right? Uh, and this and the and the challenge is this is like to teach surgery, you basically have to at some point let the learner do it because as one of my favorite quotes from Mark Twain, you can only learn so, so many things, you know, if you hold a cat by its tail. But of course, this comes with its own challenges, right? And I'm gonna side here, you know, uh, usually when, when I give this talk live, uh, I ask the 
the, uh, the the folks there to give me their challenges. But I will mention something, for example, for, of course, it's patient safety, right? Like the, if the patient is my patient uh, and I let my resident, my fellow do part of the surgery, of course, I'm concerned about the safety of the patient. Um, knowing where my learners are at, right? Like, you know, knowing, if, okay, how much can I let you do? I need to know how much you already know to be able to do. Um, the fact that sometimes we're interacting with different levels of learners. So on a specific case, I may have in the same, uh, or in, in the same, I may have a medical student, a junior resident in the first couple of years of residency, a chief resident, which is the last years of residency, and a fellow. And each one of those have this different ways that we have to approach to make, make the most of what is a, should be a great learning experience. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about this. Uh, it's different the way adult learns compared to what kids learn. If anyone that has kids like myself knows that. Uh, so some so things you just to keep in mind. Uh, I don't know if this applies to, <clears throat> to all countries in the world, but at least in the U.S., uh, we have very specific uh, limits in how many hours or residents can work uh, in a week on average. So that puts some constraints as far as when you might have to set up a resident at home. Uh, and also, you know, as, as departments grow, things like that, you know, if, when you have too many surgeons, but too little uh, residents or vice versa, that might present a challenge in itself. Uh, in our field, in the field of otorhinology, uh, we tend to play with great toys, such as endoscopes, robotic surgeries, lasers, drills, you name it. Um, and it's a little bit different teaching a, a, a learner through an endoscopic case where you are not holding the camera, they're holding the whole thing. Versus, for example, if you are doing a head and neck case where the neck is open and everyone ha has their hands on the field. Uh, so those things, I think, also present a challenge in my in my, in my memory. Uh, our field is well known for the huge range of procedures that we do, right? We do office procedures, we do open surgery, things like that. So, you know, at least in the U.S., when in 10 years we, uh, you know, in five years, so we have to teach our learners, uh, you know, we have all these different things. Ear surgery is different than endoscopic kind of surgery, is different than head and neck surgery, it is, it is, it's different than laryngology, for example. And on top of that, you know, uh, in departments such as ours, where, where we're lucky enough to have very robust subdivisions, so we have about, about 10 head and neck surgeons, about eight or nine rhinologists, all residents are learning, probably doing the same procedure but in a number of different ways. And that can be a challenge, of course. Um, as I mentioned, we like toys. So we always find ways to put new things that people invent in our things. So as these new technologies and techniques come out, how would implement a, a good teaching environment for that? And I think it's a special mention to a way procedure, so, which a lot of us do in the office. And, and it's hard, right? Like it's hard to teach a patient that's completely awake and just let the resident just do it. So how, you know, just just keep that in mind that you might have to have a little debrief before the, uh, the, the procedure. So of course, <clears throat> I think uh, uh, in the past few years, I think surgical teaching uh, has become more and more something that we have, have been looking at more closely. Uh, I don't think that was the case maybe 20, 30 years ago, at least in our field, right? Uh, I think the general surgeons uh, um, through the American College of Surgeons have a very robust uh, force as far as surgical education. But I think in ENT is something fairly new and, and definitely COVID, as we've seen some examples here of these of this, um, presentations, sort of brought some challenges that were unique to that time, the pandemic. Uh, so let's start, you know, there's different ways to define learning. Uh, this is one of my favorite ways of, of that I found is that learning is a change in practice as a result of an experience, right? Meaning that you have an experience in this case, you scrub in the case in the OR and hopefully you learn something. And another way to think about it is that if you go through a learning experience and you truly learn something, one or two things should happen. Either you learn to do different things or you learn to do something differently. But one of those two things needs to happen at the end of that. If not, sort of a, was probably a wasted or a not ideal learning experience. Um, how we learn, there's many ways that this has described. Miller's Pyramid of Learning has been something that's been around for a long time. And sure, it sort of goes from, you know, the knows to the knows how, the show how, and the, uh, and the does. And at least for my residents and even my fellows, my, you know, we're, we're looking at the realm of the show how. Basically, they need to show us what that they can do at the end of their training, right? But at the beginning of all this, for our more junior learners, they need that, that knowledge, which is just book knowledge in how you do this. 
uh, show you how they do it, and then uh, tell, tell you they know how to do it, and then show you do it. So a, a couple of terms that I, I use a lot in the literature is competence and performance. And competence is what we see usually in training environments, right? It's what a physician does in an educational setting. Once we go out there and we are in our practice, uh, then we talk about performance, which is what we do actually in real life uh, when, you know, when the maybe the safety net is not there. You know, a, a good way also of looking at learning is as a cycle, meaning that there's no beginning and end. And again, Kolb's uh, described this a long time ago. And basically it's a cycle uh, where, where, for example, an action, which it could be seeing your first endoscopic sinus surgery because of experience, um, with the, the learning that gets to observe, you think and reflect about that experience, and then that reflection becomes an action on itself, and so forth and so forth. So it's, it's a good way of just seeing the learning, like the cliche of like the learning never ends. And uh, so that's why I like this kind of model. The way that we retain information, uh, you know, it's been shown to be different in the, depending on the media and how we do it. I always say, funny enough, when I give this talk, which is considered a lecture, you probably will remember only 5% of what I tell you, right? Um, but, you know, when we're talking about surgery, we're talking about probably this, you know, the practice doing, and in higher levels, uh, let your learners teach someone how to do it. And probably the best way to learn something is to teach it. Um, it's a lot of talk in the past, it's still today about, you know, you know the different learning styles. So this is a, a very traditional way of thinking about it, the visual learner, auditory learner, kinesthetic learner, basically saying that we all have different ways <clears throat> that we learn better. However, like more and more, and this is article just four years old in New York Times, but it cites a lot of good research. It's been shown that it really doesn't matter. And it's probably not that true that there's different, that I am visual learner versus maybe you are an auditory learner. And this was has been shown in multiple research where people that are still described as one of the styles, they, they, they get taught something in a different style and there's no difference. Uh, so probably not important to know, really. Well, something that's interesting is just to look at the way adult learners may be classified. And that's, this one just a typical classification here. And you might have experience. You might have that resident that a little more risk taking that wants to basically just jump in the, you know, in the deep end of the pool and do it. Um, versus uh, maybe, maybe that learner that's more effective, as we say, the example here, where you have to give them you know, continuous feedback and they like to know like, hey, you're doing great, keep going, you're doing great, keep going. So of course, this is not something that you probably realize the first time you are with a learner, but if you have someone that's in your service for weeks or months, you know, maybe you get an idea and hopefully you can find ways, okay, what can I do here to maybe reach out and learn a little bit better? But of course, we're talking about teaching surgery or teaching procedures, it comes down to teaching psychomotor skill, right? Um, so, which is a different realm of teaching. So we talk about, you know, the domains of learning being cognitive, affective, and psychomotor. Medicine traditionally is very, very heavy on cognitive learning, meaning the knowledge that's kind of like the reading of the book, the article, knowing, you know, what to do. And that's very important. And, and that's where you should start usually, right? Like, like the same way that sometimes we ask one of our residents, okay, tell me about the anatomy of the, of the, of the sinus. And tell me why we do, what are the indications of this procedure and what's the pathology? That's all cognitive learning. So you do have to know that. And that, we go back to that pyramid that I show you, that's kind of like the, 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 the knowledge part of the base and the knows how. But we're talking today mostly about this part, which is psychomotor skills, um, which is a whole different way of learning. And what's a psychomotor, what's a skill? Well, a skill is defined in many ways. One way is, as a, it's not a reason, okay? It's a complex set of movement that require practice to get better. Uh, the more you do it, the more the, the more you're gonna get better at it. Um, and we know from good research that things like feedback, the motivation of the learner, the practice environment are, is gonna affect in one way or another the way that our learners acquire that skill. Okay, and specifically when it comes to feedback, the more specific the feedback is given to the learner, the faster the skill will develop. So that's very important because I think that's something that we're gonna you're gonna see the theme of this talk. It's going to be more and more kind of like what I want you to remember that 5% from a lecture that I was telling you about. Uh, you know, Fitz and Posner uh, were uh, uh, psychologists that did, did a lot of research. And not surprisingly enough, a lot of this stuff comes from the sports world. So people that look at athletes and things like that. Um, and they talk about these three phases, the cognitive phases, 
the social faces and autonomous faces. And as you can see by this, the more you practice, the more you move to the, the next phase. And the more the more advanced you are in these three phases, the more the less attention it requires. And if you ever play a sport, uh, you know, tennis, or if you ever try your like I have also my hand at golf, um, you can relate to this, right? Like, like when you're first, for example, holding a golf club and you're learning how to swim a golf club, you are thinking about the position of your my feet, how's my hips, how's my arms, I need to go down, keep your head down, don't jump up. So you have to think all the things in your mind. And it's hard versus as you become better, some of those things just happen. And that's where you, you go into the autonomous part of it. Um, so one way to think is that cognitive is like what to do, associated is how you do it. And then autonomous really is what you're hoping is that your the skills become automatic. This is another way of do, of seeing these three stages. So the cognitive stage tends to be the shorter one, hopefully, where it has the bigger, the bigger uh, um, angle on the on the learning curve. And then, of course, once we get to the autonomous stage, which is probably where hopefully you finish when you finish your training, to be honest, you keep getting better. And hopefully what we call a master's, which is defined different ways, is something that just takes years. So like our goal is not to, to train masters out of residency or fellowship. Uh, we just give them the tools to hopefully get there. Um, but the way that we taught surgery has changed a lot over time, right? So early on, this is sort of like, the way it was done in Europe, uh, you know, this master apprentice model, also called apprenticeships, where you, you basically shadow someone for years. It could be even decades until you learn the craft uh, on one-on-one. Um, well, things have changed. And William Halsey, which is a very, it's basically the father of, I would say is a father of, uh, at least in the US, uh, of modern, of sort of modern, or what was considered modern theoretical teaching, uh, who coined the, the the phrase, which is at least said a lot here in the U.S. I don't know if that applies to your countries. That you see one, you do one, you teach one. Uh, he was the first chair of of a general surgery at John Hopkins, and he came back from Europe and he was very impressed, especially specific in the German school, how the surgeons there had a very uh, very advanced cognitive knowledge of what they're doing. And then when he came back, he sort of mix what we saw there, which was what's happening in, in, in Hopkins with Dr. Osler, which is his counterpart in internal medicine. Again, all these names that we probably have heard through history and came out with this like the principles of surgical teaching, which is the way that for the most part still, hopefully things are changing, uh, have been taught, right? And, and his, his principles were that, you know, a resident needs to have a lot of opportunities to actually care about patients uh, under supervision of an attending. Uh, you also have to have a knowledge base in the scientific knowledge of the disease you're treating. So you're not just being a butcher and cutting things out. Um, and your the, the development of skills should go, should be increasing complexity uh, as, as well as the level of independence and responsibility. So hence why, you know, places like the U.S., we have, you know, four or five year residency programs where every year you basically go through that. Our complexity goes up but also the level of independence goes up. But of course, the way the ore looks in the years of Halstead has changed a little bit compared to the way nowadays the ore looks, right? And these are just some examples of some of the cases in, in my service. So as I mentioned, the technology, the number of learners, things like that is way different. So we shouldn't be doing the same way that we do in teaching probably, uh, you know, 60 or, or years ago or so, okay? <clears throat> so, how you know what there's different ways of how you can go about teaching a skill um Peyton's four-step approach is something that I actually sometimes like you know think about the way that I teach something and it goes first uh the, the first step you as the as a, as a professor the teacher you sort of demonstrate the skill okay and in his case he's, he says in silence which is not applicable all the time but this is probably the first time that that resin comes to the OR with you and you're like, okay you know what you never done a septoplasty. Let me. No, I want you to see what I'm doing for the first time, right? So that's that's kind of like step one. Um, and, and, and in real life, step two probably is combined with step one, but it's like you show a skill while you're explaining the steps. Okay. Uh, so basically, you're going through the case. You say, "Okay, you do this. You do that. This is the next step." Okay. Then is it number three is asking the learner, "Okay, tell me about tell me about all the steps." Okay. And it can be even as simple as like, 
what do I do next? Even if you are doing the case, for example. And then, of course, the last one is you have to let the learner perform the task. It's a very structured way. But, for example, step one or two it could be as simple as giving a resource as a YouTube video on a fest, right? And things like that. So you can actually use some of that, these techniques in a more advanced setting in how you learn, how you go about teaching. Another way of thinking about it, which is a way that uh, I probably use more, is it called the switch model, which if I remember well, switch was a cardiothoracic surgeon uh, in Kentucky, I want to say. And he talked about these four levels too, the show and tell, smart help, the dumb help, and the no help. Uh, this is more detail. So as I mentioned, show and tell probably is the first time that the resident and your fellow is there, never seen the procedure, never done it. You show them. The smart health is when you are there and really, even though they're doing some of it, you are really guiding them. So imagine if you're doing a, a tracheostomy and you as an attending are doing a very good retraction. So you make life easier for your learner, right? Uh, the dumb help is, is when you are going to assist, but that's what I tell my residents, look, do only what you tell me to do. So I'm going to put the retractor where you want me to put the retractor. I want you to, I'll, I'll, I'll bow you when you tell me to bow you. I'm not going to do anything myself necessarily uh, automatically unless you tell me, right? And of course, the no help is hopefully when you kind of step back and just let the uh, let your learner do the case while you, you're watching, you're there, but you de definitely need to give it an independence. Um, I'm going to go back to this because there's something nowadays that we're using this more and more, but this is a very useful uh, mechanism of just looking at the way you should see your learners in the OR. Uh, one of the ways to assist, you know, learning, uh, especially if you're looking at the, you know, the show and tell or the, you know, or the show and tell smart help, is simulations, right? Simulations are nowadays are very useful. Um, and this could be anything. This could be a cadaver course for, a, you know, sinus or a temporal bone lab for otology. Uh, nowadays, we're talking about, you know, virtual environments, uh, model, things like that. But it's a good use to basically get that first hump of learning with, with a teaching a skill. We could have a whole talk about, for one hour about simulation, which is not the goal of this. Uh, but again, there's some examples. I, I was giving this talk not long ago to my, my the plastic surgery department here at Emory. So this a slide that there, but you know, they have like simulators for breast reconstruction, for extremity reconstruction, things like that. And of course, we have the same in our field in ENT. But to have a simulation, you have to, you know, to be effective, it has to be organized. So, you, you know, and it has all these things. And going back to feedback, right? I just don't let my residents or my fellows go in the temporal bone lab or the or a cadaver head in, in the sinus lab and just, okay, just go crazy. No, like, okay, what are going to be your goals today of this dissection? How do you do? Um, I'm going to, hopefully you can find ways to measure if what you're doing in, in the simulation affects the way you are, are doing the skill in the OR. That can be a little more tricky, for example. And even for folks like us that are already out of training, official, you know, structured training, you know, what's the role maybe of simulation just to maintain and improve our, our skills, right? Uh, and I always give the sample that in uh, here in the U.S. on the NBA in basketball, right? Like Steph Curry is probably the best shooter in the world. Uh, he still has a shooting coach. He still has someone that's watching him shoot every day and giving him feedback, you know, his technique. Even probably he's the best to ever done it, right? So why we surgeons don't have some way that even after training, maybe get some feedback as we go through and get better. And the goal here is to become an expert, right? You know, not necessarily through... Uh, through all just in residency, but even give you tools to after residency, get to that point, right? And this is a famous quote from Bruce Lee that I always like, because it comes down to repetition. There's a famous book uh, here in the US from Michael Gladwell, I Call Out Liars, it's been out for a while now. Uh, and he quoted there this, this, this 10,000 hour rule, which is basically saying that if you, if you wanna become a master of something, it requires for you to do something for about 10,000 hours. And, and he didn't come with this but himself. He actually came this from Anders Ericsson, which is uh, wrote this book called Peak. If you're interested in performance and things, it's a great read. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Ericsson passed now a few years back. But he specifically talked here about, he, he was someone that basically follow high-end athletes, chess players, ballet dancers, things like that. People in their, in the, in the peak of the mastery, 
and try to figure out, okay, how did he get there? And basically, yeah, he came out with this 10,000 hour rule, but it says basically that it has to be 10,000 hours of what he called purpose practice, purposeful practice, meaning that you have to have, what does that mean? Well, similar to the simulation that I was mentioned, practice that have goals, that is focused, that involves feedback. Again, that word feedback, again, is, keeps coming, right? And also, at some point, you need to let the learner get out of their comfort zone. So he quoted this, they not try harder, but try things differently. So, okay, how you approach this problem differently? So if you think about this, we're talking about in the OR, how can we the, how can we implement this thing? So the OR, the historical case that when your residents or fellow becomes purposeful practice. And that's, that, that's a key thing. So some of the stuff that we talked about already, kind of having that model in your mind, how to go about it. But definitely involving involve feedback. Uh, notice we the way that we have ever pay or or, or residents in the US, we we go about this, how we assess learning is called about these milestones that every residency in the US have the same sort of degree of check marks. And it's based on this, where we sort of start novice, advanced beginner, competent. And we want to try to get our pay or our residents in this profession into experts. So <clears throat> How do I try, and full disclosure, I don't do this in every single case. You know, li life is busy, the, the hospital is busy, we may have multiple rooms going, it's late at night. So I'm not saying that I do this in every single case, but I try to do it in most cases. So the first thing is what they call seeing the learning climate, right? If you are an attending a professor which scares the hell out of your learners, that might not be the best way to impact and set the learning climate. So you know, if your learners know, okay, Feedback is part of this. Look, you know, you, you're going to be engaged in the process. They, they're going to be coming just at the beginning of the case with a much better mindset to learn. You know, try to assess where your learners are at. You know, and that could be as simple as asking them, how many of these cases have you done? Which parts of this? Okay. But know where they're at before you start the case. And if you can, try to establish objectives for that one case. Uh, and there's different ways of doing this, to be honest. And in my, in my practice, it depends on the level of learner. So, you know, what we call directive or democratic, uh, it's been described. So for me, that directive way of setting objectives for learning is basically for my more junior young residents. And I say, hey, for this fest, my goal for you is that I want you to open the maxillary and trust me and remove the Buddha. And I will tell you what my goal is. Versus for my more advanced learners, like my fifth year residents, my fellows, definitely, I will be more like, what do you want to get out of this case? And then they might say, well, Dr. Enriquez, I want to actually do this frontal today. Right? Okay, so that's the case. Why don't you let me do the beginning of the case so we can go through that a little more efficient and we can spend more time in the frontal for you to do it, right? And always thinking about why what we're doing is important, right? Every procedure has steps that we can define, but not only the steps, I think it's important to define the transition steps. So how do you go from taking the bulla out in a in surgery to going through a, through the basal lamella into the posterior endmoids, into the sphenoid, right? So you have to also let your learners, especially the advanced learners, go through those transitional points. <clears throat> and during the procedure, be engaging, of what we call radio silence. Don't just be silent until they're doing surgery and everyone's quiet. And if it's a teachable moment, make sure you're identified, meaning, you know, that could be as simple as a complication, you know, as a, but that's a teachable moment, right? Uh, one people, one of and it's, uh, uh, famous in the school so used to say, like, when, when you get into the karate in a school based case, that's when you hit record in the video, because you want to be able to show what went wrong and how you manage that. And that's a teachable moment, right? Then there can be a debrief, you know, it's something, but don't, don't be shy of, of pushing people out of the way when something is happening. Uh, and again, going back to feedback, 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 which is different ways of doing this. So this could be a topic that is very big nowadays, at least here in the U.S. in the educational environment, or more younger residents want feedback, They ask, uh, which is probably not something that maybe 20 years ago when I was a resident was something that we asked for that much. And we could have a whole talk about how to give good feedback, but I want to give you a few pointers here, right? So uh, this the cartoon in the, in the right is what people call... So like the shit sandwich. So when you give a good feedback, followed by a bad feedback, and then a positive feedback, right? And that's not the best way of doing it, but it's one way of doing it. Uh, but in general, you want feedback to be immediate. So if I tell you about how well you're doing two months after the case or four weeks after the case, 
there's not much benefit. We want to try to find space close after the event to give some feedback. It wants to be specific, right? And frequent, so they know that's coming. So it's not shocking, like, oh my God, Dr. Enriquez, Dr. Regani just told me that I need to improve in this. He's never told me before this, so it must be bad. No, like, if they know that you put this as part of your learning process, your learners will expect you to go give them feedback, right? Um, you know, you can get the feedback and keep it brief. You can, you don't want to give feedback on 10 different things that should improve because it might be overwhelming. So you pick two, maybe three at the most, things that can improve, things that they can actually improve, right? Um, avoid sanctions or threats. I think that's something that still in the surgical world happens sometimes, but you want to try, try to avoid that. And as I mentioned again, just make it part of the learning cycle. Uh, different ways of giving feedback. Minimal is as good as saying, good job, or you made a mistake, not that useful. Behavioral, uh, which is probably the best one, uh, one of the best ones is describing what happened with behavior. So for example, you say, hey, I need you to dissect them, this nerve a little more, more gentle, right? That, that's it's describing a specific behavior that they can work on versus just saying, you need to do a better job dissecting the nerve. And even better, it's what, what takes more time is what, I, what they call interactive feedback, which is feedback given you know, by both. And the way to do this, and this works with your kids a little bit also, uh, I'll show you in a second here. Um, again, this is where how you go basically on giving feedback depending on the level of learning. But we're talking mostly here, right? In in the show how, but in the in this ones we talk about tests, things like that. But we're talking more about this and the skills development. Uh, one new thing that's coming on the pipeline here in the U.S. and we actually are are uh, implementing this at Emory is uh, actually a a uh, smartphone-based way to get program to make feedback. This is called Simple. <clears throat> this was developed by the American College, College of Surgeons. Uh, and it's an app that uh, that you can, they both, you, everyone has in the department, the residents, uh, and then after you drive through that case, you basically, as a educator, it takes about less than five minutes. You go on your phone and you say, in this case, and it goes by the switch scale that I mentioned to you there. You know, show me how, smart help, dumb help, no help. And you can give that, and that gets sent to the, to the, uh, to the learner, and it, they can follow through how things are going over time. So it's a great way. As I mentioned, we, we still haven't done it. Uh, they actually do some papers uh, about how reliable and valid this is, and it's been pretty good. So we're excited. Hopefully, one of my colleagues is spearheading this at Emory, and we're excited about how this is going to work for us in the residency program. This is the way that I try to get feedback when I can, when I, when I have the time to do it, uh, is that I first ask my learner, okay, what do you think when, when and I let them tell me what they think they did well. And for me, that's useful because I can focus. Maybe sometimes I agree with them. Maybe sometimes I'm like, oh, I think you are you're wrong, buddy. I think, okay, let's talk about that. And then I tell, okay, you know what? This is what I think you did well. And then the next part, okay, tell me what you could be do, what you could you could have done better, or what could have been done better, right? And then they tell me that. And the same thing, they might be focusing on the wrong things. And then I ring up, you know what? That's fair, but I think you should really work on this, these two things. And it's a way to sort of give the feedback as, as a more structured way. The last part is like, as a, as a teacher, we also should see We're having some technical issues. We, he, um, Osvaldo, unfortunately left. We will ask him to reconnect. Please hold on a second. All right, let's see. Um, I will, there we go. Here's him. Perfect, okay. Osvaldo, yeah, you're here. Please. I'm here, I'm here, sorry guys. I think something happened with my computer and uh, and then somehow disconnected. So let me no, put that, we're all done. Please reshare. Yeah, we're gonna reshare and we're almost done. So uh, let me reshare real quick. Uh, share. Sorry about that. This looks like it's been a day of technical difficulties. There we go. Can you see it, Puyas? Yes, good? perfectly. All right, so to finish, uh, you know, I was saying that it's important to, to seek feedback from our learners, right? As a teacher, that's teaching is a skill. The same way that you are learning how to do surgery as a teacher, so uh, you need to get better. So you need to get feedback. So don't, don't be shy to ask your learners what you could be doing better, 
you know, how can I reach to you better? Even your colleagues, sometimes you can reach out to them. There's some hospitals that have programs where you, you get someone shadows you for a clinic or an OR and give you some feedback. It's called coaching. Going back to the, what I mentioned about Steph Curry and, and the coaching, um, the short coach, but just kind of like an idea just to get better. So, you know, this is a quote from one of the, from the plastic surgery literature saying that, you know, see one, do one, teach one. We probably should be thinking about see one, learn from the outcome, do many with supervision, learn from the outcome, teach many with supervision, learn from the outcome. So talking about that constant feedback after each part of the learning process. Um, so if you want to learn something from this, that, that 5% that I mentioned to do, I think the main thing is be structured if you can about your teaching. It's hard to do it every single case. I don't. I, I'm not saying try to do this, you know, uh, every single case. But maybe pick a case if it's the first case of the day where things are chill. There's more time. Okay, let's make this the one case that I'm gonna be the best teacher I can be. And then I, when it's five o'clock, and I tell my residents, look, after five six o'clock, teaching ends. We just wanna get out of the house. Let's get let's get this going, right? So that might be a little bit different, you know. Um, and really key, make make feedback part of the essential. A process of your learning cycle so people know about it and get good at it and i will leave you with a, with a quote from a fake uh a fake teacher but it's true you know one of the beautiful things about teaching or learners is that they go out there in the world your resident your fellow and they become a little part of you right and this uh, you know this is one of my favorite quotes from a from, from the star wars i'm a star wars fan so i'll put it I, i'll end with this so with this i want to say thank you again to puya for inviting me hopefully there were some good pointers for everyone here to apply as a teacher or learner and any questions, comments, I'm happy to uh, to entertain those for you. Yeah, we're going through them. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I think that this meeting should be shared a lot, not only through the residents or our colleagues. I think that this goes out to all, to everyone that will build their future as a master or head of the department or whatever, any kind of teaching, uh, uh, you know, program manager. I agree. They should watch and learn about the mistakes and how to avoid, especially as you said, we in the, you know, this century will make some difference. And we have some some uh, questions from our from the audience. Some of them, to be honest, are pretty um, impressive. So let's go straight to them. The okay. first question, the first question is coming out from uh, Poland. How do we get motivated if our chief wouldn't allow us to perform surgeries? Yeah, so that, that's hard, right? Uh, so I will say this, and I, of course, I, I didn't train in Europe uh, or on Poland, for example. I did my med school back home in Venezuela. So I from South America, as you can tell from my accents, but did my residency in the US. So making some assumptions, but I do know that some of the teaching environments in South America, at least in Venezuela, are very much like, you know, the chief resident wants to do everything. And that, and that comes sadly because maybe there's not many opportunities. You know, I remember uh, seeing uh, chief residents in Venezuela that wanted to do a tonsillectomy, right? And they wanted to do it. When it's something that, you know, in the US, for example, that a chief is not expected to do that. Like that's a, that's a junior resident level, right? If anything, the chief is, is expected to. So I do think that one way of maybe changing that um, is it's, if the chief knows how to do it, maybe giving the role, okay, I want you to walk through this junior resident how to do the case. And that's my goal for you, is to see how you teach this. And hopefully you get a little more interaction. But it's hard. It's hard in those, in those programs where it's only three years of training and, you know, and then the, the bad behaviors get passed down, right? Oh, my teach never let me do anything. I'm not going to let you do anything when I become a chief. So that maybe is the last point of that. I, when you become a, a chief, find ways to actually be a better teacher to your junior residents and not, and not go by the, oh, I had it bad, I'm gonna have it bad too. The other question is coming from Egypt. How should I learn a specific subspecialty if my boss is not letting me move or attend international courses? <laughs> oh man, <laughs> these are hard questions to answer. So, <laughs> you know, the beautiful, uh, you know, I'll say this. I think one thing that has that came out of the pandemic is the fact that nowadays we have activities such as this, where where I think the 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 sharing of knowledge in a specialty, and I think this applies to every specialty. I'm, I'm assuming in medicine, but definitely you know we see things like 
this initiative in Asosano, where you have speakers which are given for free and you can see that. Uh, of course, it's hard because this, this is useful, I think, but it goes by much more in that cognitive level of learning, right? Like I'm giving you some tips, things like that, but you need to do it. Uh, and that, that's going to be hard. So, um, you know, sometimes it might be the case that, you, you know, you look at the evidence and there's papers on this. Like, look, if I do this, the more I do it. And then go to your learner leaders in your program and be like, I want in this course because I know this is what I want to do. Um, versus I just want to go just because of it. So make a case. But yeah, you know, the infrastructure, the resources are limited. It's the same thing in the U.S. sometimes here. It's not like our residents go to every single course that they can go. Um, but I do think that at least, you know, surgical videos, things like that. There's such a, you know, life surgery nowadays that, you know, we've done this, you know, I know Puya has done this through this platform too. So there's ways to, to do that. But of course, if they have some stuff, that needs to happen. Like, like you can learn only so much by watching someone, especially early in the learning. Like when you get to maybe at a level that as an attending, it's easier to watch something and just apply it in yourself. But at the early, you have to do it because, because it's just hard to learn just by watching. Well, basically, as you said, we're giving you somehow with this platform the information that you need. Of course, you need training and, and the way that you train yourself will make a difference. But what we're giving to you naturally are, are the basic foundation that yeah. you should learn from that. And we give it for free. As you say, this is not only free. This is, a, in my opinion, as a building a community and a kind of right. a teaching uh, purposes of what we're doing. So there's a lot of way to do it. Um, I want to move forward with this uh, last uh, other two questions. I love this one from Brazil. What is your opinion regarding artificial intelligence? Ah, wow. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I, you know, I think that's coming. Um, uh, you know, I, I have a couple of partners that, that do some work on that. Of course, the uh, AI or artificial intelligence, I see, I see that most in the realm of clinical care, right? So, you know, in our field, uh, one of our partners is working on, a, on an app where, where to, the, to sort of discover cancer in the larynx by, by the dysphonia, things like that. Um, uh, so looking at big databases, as far as how artificial intelligence is going to play a role in education, I think I'm fascinated by I'll be honest, I'm not an expert on it. Uh, I think the, the problem is that with any, as far as I know, with any AI system, they're only as good as the data you put in the system. So if, you, if we go with all the biases and all the bad behaviors that teachers do in surgery in any sort of AI. So, you know, I could see, for example, in the future, something like for our ear case or endoscopic case where we have a video where you can actually put the video in an AI system and it can give you sort of like an analysis of like waste of motion, things like that, trauma to the mucosa, stuff like that. But we still, I think we're still far away from that because I think the first thing is going to be the realm of, it, uh, of clinical care before, before education, but it's coming. Yeah, I think that's what would you say is as perfect match. It depends on the information we're providing. Imagine we, we use navigation, right? So every time you use a navigation, you have to set up the limits of your, of your, of your face. If it fails, then, then, the, then the information that you have are not correct. So it depends on how we place those information to yeah. the intelligence and what we get from them. Last question that we move, uh, that we, we run out of time. Uh, yeah. This question is from Spain. When should we move private? I love this one because somehow. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, when should we move private? I, I don't know. It's like, wait, how, wait, the, the, you guys have a very thoughtful question. I think, Alina, you know, it's, it's early for me, but I feel like I need a cup of wine to, to think about these questions. Uh, so, you know, it's again, it's a little bit different for us because I know in places, I think Spain is similar, but I know in many countries in the world, South America, Australia, and I think some of Europe, you can have dual practice, right? People have their private practice, and then you might be teaching for a couple of days a week, which is kind of like you do it for because you like it. The US is a little bit different. US, when you are part of a place like Emory, I'm full-time here. I'm not able to have multiple jobs. Like I don't have a private clinic that I go in with a residence. Like you are full, and that applies to, I think, every educational environment in the US, right? So to be, you know, 
teaching takes time. Teaching takes patience. You know, I could do, you know, many more cases in one day and be home earlier if I'm doing my cases by myself, right? But I, 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 I chose to teach because it's something that I enjoy. Um, so it comes out to be honest, to be sometimes just to be honest about yourself when you finish your residency. Like you'd be like, okay, do I want to do teaching for, for maybe from the ego of being a professor so and so, or do I truly enjoy this? And if the answer is no, it's fine. Not, not everyone is meant to be a good teacher. So then go to private, which most of the care in this world, everywhere happens in private, in the community of private practice. And that's true here in the US too. So I think it comes down to like looking inside while you, why you enjoy this, because it's hard. Like I have three small children, man. I want to be home by five, but I'm teaching this resting how to accept the at 4 p.m. That might take me 20 minutes and it's going to take an hour. <laughs> but, you know, that's what comes with it. Yeah, that that matched. And, and uh, you know, there's a difference between uh, some institution and, and others. Um, just... Uh, just to let you know, I remember two, three years ago in 2019, a correspondence on the Lancet was uh, set up from our, one of our colleagues, I know him, and he was actually uh, representing the healthcare society system, which is in Italy, and how much differences you will see through the education provided in different region and different part of Italy, like Southern compared to the North part are completely different. And how much importance do we need to provide to have a stratified education yeah. in Italy? I can imagine worldwide how it is, but oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so so that's that's what we should learn to get for the future to be equally, you know, uh educated somehow and uh yeah that, that's what it is what's your opinion yeah. on this no i think it's true no especially when it comes to you know the way we teach surgery it's gonna be different so when i when i see those questions and, and i love you know poland brazil spain all corners of egypt um it's you know sat you know for better or for worse each each environment has their own ways of going through this some some bad habits have been passed along um uh through through the times and it's hard it's hard to change that so you know one of my hopes i usually give this talk this talk i give it mostly in the uh in the u.s department so not only ent's but also specialties um uh, but yeah but here i would say there's sort of like a system already to do that but i give it this also for venezuela for colombia um and now for the whole world here with that and i know some things might be different to apply right like like maybe your your, your older attending that's been doing the same way for 40 years, you know, if you ask him, hey, so and so, I want to give you feedback, they're going to be like, what? I don't know what that means. You know, like, and it's going to be hard. So uh, it's going to start with small changes, hopefully. I think like anything in, in our field is it's evidence, evidence-based. evidence And we know with, with evidence that these things help. And if we train better, if we train you better, you're going to do better and our patients are going to be taken care of better. And, you know, that spans, you know, you're going to, take that all the way to healthcare in a country, right? So as simple as me making you a better teacher, like that one slide from Yoda, is because you're going to go there and plant the seed. And it's, gonna, it's not going to make you only a better teacher. It's going to help your, your patients. Yeah, exactly. So thank you, Osvaldo, for being with us and your time, your effort uh, to spend some time with us. Uh, anyone interested, you can watch this uh, meeting again in our or our social media platform. I would like to remind you the appointment for tomorrow evening, 8 p.m. Um, uh, CET time, uh, the ERS uh, in conjunction um, with uh, different um, speaker around the world. We are going to talk, I'm, I'm a part of the, of, the, of the panel, we are going to talk about dif difficult and interesting cases in the rhinology. And also um, on Friday, we will re repeat one of our latest uh, uh, meetings, which was uh, in regards to olfaction and frailty. And uh, Nicholas Rowan will uh, explain how, how much uh, interaction there are in connection between olfaction and frailty. Uh, thank you, Osvaldo, for being with us. And I really hope to see you and have some emory uh trainees for the upcoming meeting and of course your position for the next uh, semester all right man thank you so much boy. it's always been a pleasure man uh thanks everyone for listening to me 
Uh, yeah, hey, feel free to reach out. If you Google me, you'll hopefully find my email, Emery. So, hey, Puya, I'll, I hope to see you soon, man. Take good care. Bye-bye.